So hi, I'm Jeff Leiswitz. I'm here with Brown Paper Tickets. I'm the author of NFA, Not Effing Around, the No Bullshit Guide to Getting Your Creative Dreams Off the Ground. And I love talking to creative people, right? So here's Kelly. How's it going? It's going well. How are you? All right. It's going great. So tell me about what you do creatively. What's your, what's your thing? Well, I am... I started off as a poet. Well, I started off as a fiction writer, became a poet, um, wrote some books, started a press, and then now design the covers on the press, for the books, uh, for the press. That's fantastic. You yeah. sort of do it all. Now I'm doing more, yeah. Yeah. So that's what I do creatively. That's fantastic. Yeah. So what, like, what drew you to this whole thing in the first place? How did you get into this whole world? It's... Well, I was in it as a kid so I was always writing and then I joined a corporate career which was it a fit and sometimes having something that's not a fit will tell you more about your life than um, starting and knowing what you're doing so the fact that I thought I wanted a corporate job attempted a corporate job was being promoted and doing really well in it but hating my life really helped me decide oh, okay I'm on the wrong path so I left my job and ended up here in this small town, which you took a ferry to get to. Yeah. <laughs> I did indeed. You did. <laughs> and I liked it. it yeah. So it takes a lot of guts, I think, to quit a job that seems secure, that you're getting promoted in, yeah. probably getting paid all right, Right. to do what you love. What, like, what was that about? It was really hard. I, I was so desperate to leave. I left before, if I'll use a corporate term, I was fully vested. I was six months from being fully vested in my 401k, but I needed out. I think having a father who was um, a vice president of a company and seeing how much he worked, that I realized I was becoming that person, but in my 20s. So I abandoned ship early. And it was scary because I knew I would just have to live on less. And I amazing when you make less money you spend less money simple math <laughs> <laughs> I ain't no mathematician <laughs> but, but I figured that out yeah so I did not make as much and oddly I did not spend as much and and one thing I think too when you're working a corporate job or a more structured or you end up spending money because you never have any time to think about things so you end up going out for lunch or taking the easy things or I'm gonna stop at home and get dinner and plus I gotta buy these outfits for work and so I was buying a lot more um, things than I do now because just out of convenience and just being busy yeah so are you happier just in general now with your life and lifestyle yeah. being a, a creative type rather than being a corporate type I'm a thousand times happier. Um, I think because for me, time has always been a bigger value than money. And my time, we, we all live on this planet like we're here forever and it's a limited time. So the fact that I know already like, okay, this is a temporary existence. I don't want to be in something I don't want to do. I'd rather make adjustments so I can live a more creative life, which is what I do. Fantastic. Yeah. Good call. Thanks. <laughs> I try. <laughs> hey, right on. Um, so what do you love about what you do now? About being a writer, um, I, I like, actually, I, I really just like writing. You know, I could just do that. I could just sit down and write and write and write. And if nobody ever saw what I wrote, I would be okay with it. It's being in that moment where you don't really know where you're going and you're trying to create something. Um, then when it goes out into the world, which is a whole other thing, the publishing aspect, I love it when people find something I've written and tell me they've connected with it. So I don't know. I love all aspects of it. I love not being on the same path as anyone else. That, I think, was a struggle when I was younger because there's the fear of, everyone's doing this and I'm doing this, but I've always learned I'm happier when I'm not doing what everyone's doing. Very good. Yeah. Making your own choices, your own path. Yeah, I think it's, I think we live in a culture where, especially most careers, if you know you want to do something, you take this, you do this, you do this. We all ended up as writers and creative people through different different things and flukes, just weird things we've done. We weren't planning on it or 
you know, when I took that corporate job, I wasn't thinking, oh, in four and a half years, I'm going to quit this and completely change my life around. But it happened. <laughs> Things happen. <laughs> I, we weren't planning on starting a press. I mean, that happened on a ferry boat. Do you tell? <laughs> yeah. We had wanted to publish this, this book. Fire on Her Tongue. It's an anthology for women's poetry. It's now in print, but at the time, we had gotten ebook readers, and there were no books of poems out for women, anthologies. So we thought we would, Annette Spalding Convy and I thought we would start, we would make an ebook and then um, publish it. And nobody was doing, of course, poetry is always lagging in like the e department, anything electronic. So we had to publish it ourselves, and then. So we started a press. <laughs> no it look. was just an accidental thing. It really was supposed to be one book. And then we just kept finding more and more books we liked and projects we wanted to do. Cool. So we kept doing it. That's fantastic, <laughs> I know. right? I know. Fantastic. So I want to go back a little bit. Uh huh. You were talking about when you, when you put out your work and you hear from somebody, I guess, online or in person or whatever, that they really connected with something that you're talking about, an mm -hmm. idea or a story or whatever, a poem. How does that make you feel? It makes, well, the bigger picture makes me feel like, okay, this is, this is doing its job. Like that, there's that, um, you know, they always talk about this, the butterfly and then creates a big storm, you know, on the other side of the world. It's that idea of connecting with one person and somehow, um, my work is having some sort of positive effect in the world. And even if it's one person, I never discount that because I'm not about, oh my God, I write poetry. I'm not about quantity, I'm about quality. So for me, it's always been much more of a quality versus quantity. And so if one person or two people write to me and say, you know, I found your poem in this little journal and it meant a lot, to me that uh, means so much more than, I don't know, something bigger where I'm I'm not really hearing the voice of another person if that makes sense kind of yeah I don't know if I'm explaining it well but yeah that idea that I I just like I'm much I've always been much better one-on-one -on -one than one on a big group nice so cool. thank you yeah that's great um what would you say the highlight of your creative career so far has been highlight of my creative career or a highlight a highlight yeah okay a highlight for our press was um, last poetry month we were featured in Oprah so that holy crap <laughs> I know Oprah yeah and Oprah magazine or we have a deck of tarot poet tarot cards um, was featured and yeah our press and we wrote writing exercises and it was one of those things where like with this press and just kind of with my whole creative I just feel like so much of its luck and timing like my success or things that have been good that have happened to me have just because I've fallen into it and so Oprah we happened to send her some books and that was it she liked them or she the book editor <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I'd call that luck. You wrote something awesome and you sent it to somebody. Yeah. I would call that NFA. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's talk about that for a minute. NFA, not fucking around. Right. What does that mean to you as a creative type, as a poet? Um, for me, it means to you know put yourself out there, and I think that's one thing that Annette and I, with To Sylvia's Press, and just um, I know in my own writing is. I don't have that fear of rejection that other people have because I know it's part of the deal. So I'm happy to put anything out there and try stuff and I don't get my feelings hurt if somebody doesn't take my work or like it. Um, I'm not aggressive, I'm not um, kind of like a, like a self-promoter, but if, you know, the, the Oprah thing was a spur of the moment. I, I read Oprah magazine, I knew she had featured poets and I said, well, I'm gonna send her some books. So we did. I'm a poet. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't mind being featured. <laughs> right. Right. It's that same. It's just kind of throw stuff out to the universe and see what happens. Hell yeah. Yeah. So I, I think uh, many times creative people I always have that fear of 
of rejection and I think we deal with it a lot and that doesn't mean I don't have self-doubt or I'm not fearful I just push past it good yeah how do you push past your fear how do you push past your fear and doubt yeah that's a really good question I would say being a child of the 80s we didn't have like I don't know how old you are but when we were when I was younger um, as a teenager in the 80s if you had an issue Nobody talked to you about it. You didn't, um, you didn't have any sort of like therapy or we're all going to do a group intervention and really explore what you're feeling. It was just like, get over it. And so I think the positive of that is that I'm able just to push past so I don't worry too much about things. Every artist, every poet, every photographer, any creative type gets tons of rejection during their career. How do you push past fear and doubt? I push past it by just doing it, knowing that um, it's part of the job. And I think there's a, it's a quote from Sylvia Plath, and she said, I love rejections, and I think basically she says, I love rejections, it means I'm doing my job, or I'm doing the work. So if you're not getting rejections, it means you aren't putting yourself out there or, or trying to stretch past goals. So for me, it's just something I continually do to, um, if something looks like a good opportunity, if I have a good gut feeling about something, or if something just sounds like fun, I submit or send out work, and I don't feel bad if I'm not taken, because I have the up opposite end of being an editor, and I know we've taken really, we've, we haven't taken people because we've run out of space in a journal, and they're, they've been fantastic writers, so... I, I don't know, I kind of, it's, it's poetry, it's not personal. Good line. <laughs> yeah. You can start your next poem with that one. Oh, I think I stole it from RuPaul's Drag Race. I think it, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite, my favorite reality show. The truth it's comes out. It's not personal, it's drag. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Okay, great. So, how about this one? You have had some level of success in uh -huh. all that you've done, right? You've been at this for a while. What have you learned from your successes? Um, that I, that I'll never be happy. No, um, that it's, I don't know. Success is funny. It's, it, I don't know that I've learned that really it doesn't matter. I mean, that's kind of like a, a, a weird thing to say, but, um, when you first start out as a writer, like as a poet, your goal is to get a poem published. And then your next thing is to, um, oh, I publish a couple poems, I want to do a chapbook. And then you publish a chapbook, and then you want to do a book. And then, so you publish your book, and then you're like, well, I want my book to win a prize. It's a stair step. So success is something, once you get the success you think you want it, there's always another. Um, so in a way of not being satisfied, I'm always completely satisfied. Like, I celebrate, like, really small things, like, hey, I was a finalist, or, you know, let's go out to eat, or, hey, I just sent this out to this competition, or um, anything I can find a way to celebrate. So in a way of not being satisfied, I celebrate everything. That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. It is. And another really wise thing I think you said was reframing the rejection into a positive. Right. Right? A lot of people are going to look at, oh, I'm rejected, I stink, my, you know, my stuff doesn't have value. But that's not how you look at it. Right. You look at it like... You only fail if you don't try. I mean, like, that's, as a parent, that's what you're always telling your kids. Well, we hope people are telling their kids that if you don't try, that's the only time you fail. So, yeah, we have, I've celebrated just getting, making a deadline, getting my grant in, uh, you know, the final hour. Um, never, I've never received an NEA grant, but I've sure celebrated submitting one. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, it's almost as you good. you got to buy that lottery ticket yeah. if you want to win, well, right? that's exactly it. Yeah, you just, um, you find... I mean, success can be anything from, like, today I helped, uh, driving here, there was this woman with a leash, and five minutes later I see a dog running down the street, I put the two together, you know, turn back to get the woman, and we save the dog. 
So you celebrate that. I mean, that's even a bigger success than anything I'll do in writing. Yeah, that's so, cool. I don't know. I don't know. It's writing is writing. Writing is writing. Okay. Yeah. So, as you think about your success, mm -hmm. well, actually, yeah, as you think about your success in the press, in your own writing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, do you do anything to sort of either set your goals or visualize them? or any sort of system or method? Mm -hmm. what, what, what? Yeah, all of the above. Um, every year we do a vision board. I've been doing one with my partner Annette here at Two Sylvia's. We've been doing it before we were even, neither of us had books. We started doing this in 2000. Um, I don't know, I look at the things that I want it's a negative and it's a positive. I mean, I'm listening to this book about how to be in the moment, yet when you're a creative person, I think there's a part of you that can't always be in the moment because if you're creating something, it's not created, it's here. So you're always working towards it, whether it's, a, and for me right now, it's a manuscript. So I, I know where I want to be, which is the final ending, and I'm working towards it. Um, so I do, I, I make a lot, I have tons of lists. I'm a list maker, we do the vision board. Um, I try to keep good thoughts. I've never been somebody who's ever said, oh, I'm so stupid or that. So I've never had that, that negative self-talk. Um, and I just think some of that is just because I'm naive, but it works. <laughs> I never thought to like, <laughs> I, I always just have the oh well attitude, which is oh well. Just do it. Yeah. Yeah, great. So when you're working on a project, let's just say your own work. Okay. Do you feel like, do you evaluate it as you go? And does it feel to you like, wow, this is great. This is crap. This is great. This is crap. Yeah. And how do you, how do you get through that? Yeah, it always does. I, I, I think that's something that when you're starting out as a, writer or creative person, you look at people and you think, oh, when I get to that point, I'll know what I do is good. I don't think you ever know, and I think the minute you start thinking what you do is good, it's not good, because you've completely lost that sense of editing, because you think, you know, you're the bomb, everything's great, everything I do is genius. Um, so no, I constantly go through that. Um, I'll write a poem. The minute I write a poem, I'll be like, yeah, this is really good. And then, like, I'll look at the next day or two days later and think, what did I, you know, what was I doing? So, um, I don't know. I deal with it with time. So when I put together a longer manuscript, I'll look back at the poems later to make sure that they're okay. But it, I think sometimes you do need a little distance to know if what you have created, it created is good. Because or that it even makes sense. I've written poems that I thought were fantastic and, you know, three months later I look at them and think, what was I talking about? This makes absolutely <laughs> nonsense. It doesn't make sense to you. You're right. in trouble, right? Right, right. Yeah. So um, I do think distance, but, you know, again, you don't want to take too much time. I, I think that can also be used as procrastination, so you have to watch it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about comfort zone. Oh, no. <laughs> right now I'm completely out of it so good great. well then you, maybe you just answered the question do you like to stick to your comfort zone do you like to push out of it I love my comfort zone I hate pushing out of it I hate doing interviews um, all of it that's why it's so funny I'm doing it but no I don't normal I love the known I love not traveling <laughs> I love staying home um, but I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. And so I say yes to things like this because then it happens and I can't, once the ball's in motion, you can't turn back. But I don't think it's a great thing for creatives. I think you have to constantly push yourself. I push myself more emotionally and artistically in my work than I do in my life. So I might be a lot more out there in my writing than I am in my life. In my mm. life, I'm very happy just in my own little bubble. That's cool. That's great. <laughs> and I kind of think that's what writers are. Right. 
Right, like writers aren't used to this, like interviews. I mean, you get used to it, or even reading. That's an interesting thing when you become a writer and they put you in front of a podium and you have to speak to an audience of people. Like, number one, we're sphere, and many of us are introverts and we're put out there, and it's, it's frightening. But you do it, you know. I always just remember it's the work, it's not the person. So when you're up on a stage, it's your work, it's not you. Do you find that it's worth it in your work and in your life when you step out of the comfort zone, when you do the interview, when you do the reading? Sometimes. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll overthink it. Um, but sometimes I'll say, I'm really glad I did that. And it, things, I don't know, I, again, I believe in a very organic and listening to your gut and following kind of the instincts that you say yes to something. You're not really sure why you say yes to it. And then it leads to like five other things that would have never happened had you not said yes. So in that respect, yes, it's important to move and say yes and move out of your comfort zone because one thing goes five different ways and you weren't planning on it. Yeah. But it's not fun. <laughs> this is fun. This is lots of fun, but normally it's <laughs> oh, not fun. Oh, this is fun. <laughs> yeah, this okay. is a good time. Every other interview. No, every other right. interview is not fun. No, okay. well, as long as it's on email, then it's great fun. Okay. But, yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> it's you not type on. Type it out. Either. Yeah, not on podcast or video. Okay, so let me ask you this one. Um, you were talking about, um, now I've forgotten what my genius question was here. <laughs> um, you were talking about tapping into your gut and your instinct. Yes. To make, to make choices. Yes. Right? Do you have any techniques to do that? How do you, how do you tap into your gut or your instinct? Um, I believe we all know what we should be doing, but we also have this great brain that is completely, um, I don't want to say bamboozled by the world, but um, it gets a lot of input from places that might not be the best places. That's how I ended up in a corporate job. When you graduate from and get your four-year degree, you move to a corporate job because that's the next step. That's what everyone's doing. So um, it was probably in my 20s when I realized every decision I had made with my head had been wrong. Like every decision from where to live, from what kind of job to have, to all of it, what to, what to dress, what I wanted to do was all wrong. Um, the minute I started trusting my gut, I knew I wanted to write, but that's scary because there's no secure paycheck, so you don't do it. Um, I, I just think we have a voice or a feeling or something. We know what we want to do, but we come up with reasons not to do it. Like, well, of course you don't want to be a writer because that's not a secure, and, you know, and most people don't get paid, so you don't do it. So you just have to trust that what you are going to do is going to be okay. And that's the scary part. So we all know what we want, what we need to be doing in life. Whether we're doing it or not is completely you know, dependent on, there, there's the bravery question. Yeah, that's true, and that's a hell of an answer, and that's, I, I totally buy that one. Yeah, because seriously, like when people say, oh, what, you know, what is that gut voice? Well, the gut voice is, you know what you need to do, whether you're doing it or not. Do you, do you have the bravery? Yeah, exactly, because we live in a culture where we think we need certain things, or to live a certain lifestyle, or be doing certain things, or have a certain kind of job. And then we make decisions because of it. And sometimes they are detrimental to our own mental health. And sometimes people find out what they need to do by having a heart attack, by having an emotional breakdown. Um, big things because they've been completely um, misguided on what they should be doing. And I think that's kind of, you know, I guess a woo-woo way of saying it. It's the universe's way of, you know, getting you back on track. Because I really do believe we're all here to do something. And we all know what it is. We all have our own plan. We just need to follow it. Hell yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. You're awesome. Thank you. Okay. Right on. Let's keep on rocking here. Um, okay, so all that said, we know that in general, creative paths can be difficult. Mm -hmm. Right? They yeah. can they can be troubling. It can be hard to do, 
in some ways compared to a safer and secure job. So why would you choose to be a writer? I think it always, again, it comes down to I value time more than money. And I always, I'm scrappy. I can get by on, I can get by on little. And ultimately that will fulfill me more than me living a life where I'm paid well but not happy or like what I'm doing. Um, I, it's just not worth it. I, it's one of those questions like how could, I couldn't, I knew it would be the one thing that when I was older I would look back and regret. And I'm not about regrets, so um, I just have to write. I mean, I just have to do creative work. Because if I'm not doing it, I'm not happy. And if I'm not happy, I'm not very fun to be around. And that wouldn't, I would have no friends. I would just be an angry person in a well-paid job. And there's too many of those people in the world right now. I don't need to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the quote of the whole interview there. <laughs> Damn, okay. Sounds good. Uh, okay, just a couple more here. So, as a creative person, mm -hmm. how do you define success? How do I... Uh, <laughs> success. Um, how do I define the success? I, I guess I don't. I don't define success. I guess if every day I'm alive and I come to work or I go to my desk and I write something, that's success. I don't think there's, um, I don't think there's a rainbow at the end, or a, it's not a rainbow at the end, it's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I think, I think the prize is the rainbow, you know. <laughs> that's, that, that's my new favorite quote. Oh my God. You know, I think that, like, that's the prize. We're in the moment. We're in the journey. We're not going to get some... I mean, the only place we're getting is older. We're not going to arrive at some sort of spot. So... Fantastic. That's my odd answer. <laughs> hey, the odder the better as far as I'm concerned. Okay, I think I've got one more. Okay. So, writing, various kinds of arts, have been considered by some as a healing mechanism uh-huh right can you speak to that how is right is writing healing for you and in what way um yes very it's emotionally healing I went through a really tough time and it's coming on two years ago um, and I was just really struggling emotionally I was very anxious just not in a good place and I woke up every morning at 5 a.m. and I would write from 5 to 7 before anyone else in the house woke up. Um, and I look back at some of those poems and some were really good and some were horrible. And I know that the horrible ones were the ones to help me through the place. And the good ones will be are the ones that help others when they're in the place. Because one of the poems I wrote and I never do this. I wrote the poem. I revised it. Within a week, I sent it out to the New England Review, and then it was accepted. Like this all happened in a three-week time, three-week period, and I was horrified after it was accepted because it felt so raw. Like, oh my God, you know, all of my emotional struggles have has been documented in this poem that is now going to go out, and then it was shared online which again, there's an even bigger audience. Um, but what happened from that was that people then started writing me and thanking me because it, they, were, they recognized something in themselves that they were dealing with. So that felt good. I don't even remember what, what you oh, was it, is writing healing. Yes, it's healing for everyone. Reading is healing. So writing and reading. So I'm reading right now um, Blue Nights by Joan Didion. And, you know, it's very sad. It's about her daughter dying. And it's healing for me in a way that when I read, I, I call it tragic lit, like tragic memoir, like why I'm fascinated by it, but that people can get through something. So I think that's how writing heals others and how it heals myself is that if I can create something from it, if I can create art from it, then it can't kill me or hurt me. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Well, Kelly, you are a fantastic interview subject. Thank you. That was fun. <laughs> that was fun. See?
Okay. Let's well, do it again. Let's do it again. <laughs> okay, well, thanks a lot. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.